All right. Hello and welcome everybody to Cultivating Learning Art Meets Science with the Hirshhorn Museum. We are so excited to be here with you today to explore techniques to help learners look closely, experiment creatively, and learn about science concepts through playful art making. This is one of our Cultivating Learning sessions, a monthly session where we invite guest educators to come and model teaching techniques that work really well for them and using digital museum resources to support student learning. Um, during our session today, we're going to do a few different things together in the 30 minutes that we have. We're going to start off with a quick introduction and some logistics before we'll hand it off to our guests who will model um, some transferable activities and techniques, and then we'll open it up for a larger discussion. As we get started today, if you didn't catch this in the description, um, gather some materials that can stretch and suspend. We're going to be building artworks together, and this will be helpful if you want to follow along at your computer, at your desk, wherever you're joining us from. Um, so in finding materials, uh, some things that you might look for, you might look for string or rope or crepe paper, um, produce nets, old rope nylons or tights, balloons, um, and other types of suspenseful materials. Um, the three of us have some materials here today that we'll share in just a bit. Um, so... Why don't we start off with some introductions? Um, so my name is Tess Porter, and on my end, I'm joined by Philippa Rappaport. We're both educators at the Smithsonian Center for Learning and Digital Access, which is a central education office that is behind the Smithsonian Learning Lab, the host of this program. And today we're joined by our fantastic guest educator, Tiffany McGettigan, who is the lead education specialist at the Hirshhorn Museum, which is the Smithsonian's Museum of Contemporary Art. Um, at the Hirshhorn, she oversees youth programs. Today's program is part of a series of webinars exploring how to use digital museum resources to support learning. So you can see on the slide here, this is our schedule for June. We have two types of programs. One are drop-in office hours. Those are uh, Tuesday, June 1st and June 15th from 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard. And then we also have two offerings to help you really get used to using the Learning Lab, getting started and also creating collections. So those are on June 8th and June 22nd. Um, you can find the schedule and the links to each of these sessions at our help, se uh, help center, and you can see that link below. And you can also find archives of these sessions. So even today's session, if you want to watch it again later or share it with a friend, you can always go back to the help center and find the archives. The Learning Lab is a free online platform where you can discover digital museum resources from across the Smithsonian, from beyond the Smithsonian, and you can use the Learning Lab to create interactive learning experiences with them. And then you can share your discoveries and creations with others. We'll be sharing a few resources on the lab today from the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden. And you can find links to the lab collections and to those resources in the description section of this video. The Help Center isn't just a place to find upcoming and archived webinars. Um, here you'll also find step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step instructions to do basically everything you want to do in the lab, from searching for resources to building your own collections to using them with students. So today's session is interactive. Um, we would love to hear from you. We'll be asking questions throughout as we model the teaching techniques that we're diving into today. But we'd also love to hear if you have any questions, especially as you think about how to implement these uh, techniques that we'll be sharing with your own learners. You can ask questions at any time during today's session, one of two ways, depending on the platform you're joining us on. Um, so if you're watching the session on YouTube, you can interact using the chat, which you'll see to the right of the video. And then if you're joining us on Facebook, you can send questions using the comment box, which you'll see below the video on Facebook. 
So to get us started off today with the chat, we would love to hear what materials you found um, as you looked around your home, your apartment, um, for things that can stretch and suspend. Um, Tiffany, do you want to start us off by sharing what you've brought today? Sure, I would love to. Um, so I've I've found several materials. One of my favorite things uh, to use for this kind of activity is a produce net. So this had some lemons in it earlier today. I also have some um, old nylons, very, very stretchy, um, can also suspend them. Um, I've brought some clay, because we're thinking about sculpture and often when we um, sculpt, we use clay um, more traditionally. And I've brought some rubber bands um, and a few other kind of stretchy sort of string items. I have some more, but I, I'd love to see what both of you brought as well. Philippa, do you want to share? Sure. So inspired by <laughs> Tiffany, I also have some produce bags. I have an empty rice bag because why not? Great. Some old socks, another container. And then I thought I might use um, paper clips, thinking I might try to sort of join them together to to suspend objects that way. How about you, Tess? Sure. Um, so I have a lot of yarn left over from projects. And so I brought two different colors to play around with. Um, and then when I was thinking about suspending and playing around with this material, I grabbed, I have a bunch of pens that I might use to um, kind of hang from whatever structure I'm going to make. And then I also bought a pair of scissors um, so I can mess around. Um, for folks who joined us a little bit late, you may be wondering why we're showing all of these materials that we've gathered. We're going to be um, playing around with some techniques to help learners explore science concepts through playful art making. And so as Tiffany walks us through the activity today, Philip and I are going to be creating along with her. And we invite you to create alongside us too. So if you have a moment to look around in your junk drawer, see what's in your recycling bin, look for materials that can stretch and suspend um, so you can create alongside us today. And if you have materials, we would love to hear them in the chat. Um, Tiffany, I'd love to yeah. turn it over to you to get us started. This is great. So I love seeing what materials you found and how um, how so many of the things that Tess and Philippa were sharing are, are things that we've just found around our house. Um, they have other purposes. You know, the, the produce net was was to hold my lemons, right? Or the nylons that I used to wear, but they're they're old and <laughs> have holes in them now. So we all have things like that sort of sitting around that um, are really, really great for art making. Um, and I think that repurposing these everyday materials is a great way to make creativity accessible um, for any, any, excuse me, for anybody, but also to really get students thinking outside the box and experimenting um, in new ways. So um, I'm really excited to jump into this, this project today. So I'm going to be talking a little bit more about um, art meets, meets science. Um, I'm a, an art educator at the Hirshhorn Museum. And um, you know, a lot of times uh, teachers and, and people in general don't really think about um, all the cross-disciplinary connections between art and uh, science. And so um, I'm going to share a couple things that they have in common. And then we'll, we'll uh, jump in and we'll actually um, kind of experiment and try it out for ourselves. Uh, so for starters, uh, artists and scientists are both excellent at making observations of the world around them. Um, that's one thing that they both do really well. Um, also, artists and science experiment with materials. Um, and those are, those are two things that are really important to kind of note that are in common. And a lot of times artists, when they're creating something, they use the principles of science to make their work more interesting. So maybe it's incorporating light and shadows into your work. Maybe it's building a stronger structure for a sculpture. Um, or maybe it's exploring how force impacts an artwork. Uh, maybe that's splattering paint using the force of your hand, right? Or maybe in the case of what we're gonna do today, it's exploring the force of gravity 
and how that can impact um, a suspended sculpture, which is what we're going to be making. So art is often the expression of scientific principles. And I think it's really exciting to think about how art can be incorporated um, or you know, really used uh, to explore all these different ideas. Um, so today, we're going to look closely at a suspended sculpture. Um, so we're going to use our powers of observation. Uh, and then we're going to make our own. So we'll get to experiment with some materials and actually um, create our own suspended sculptures. Uh, so we'll dig in. Thank you, Tess. Uh, so right here, uh, we're sharing uh, a learning lab collection called In Suspense. Um, this is part of our Hirschhorn um, Kids at Home series. And um, we basically, we look at artworks that are in our collection and we take inspiration from those and uh, make them accessible uh, for anyone to do at home or with a, with a classroom of students. Um, so this one's called In Suspense and it's inspired by the artist Ava Hessa. Um, so we're gonna dig in and we'll go through this um, more or less step by step. And then everything that you need to do this at home or with the classroom is here for you um, with instructions um, built in and steps all laid out. Uh, so why don't we start, Tess, um, by looking closely at the, the artwork. So I believe that's the fourth, fourth tile in there. Thank you. And I'm going to invite everyone, maybe um, close out the instructions so we can see a little bit bigger. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to ask everybody to let your eyes wander up, let your eyes wander down, really look closely. As your eyes are wandering, notice the shapes and the textures. What do you see? Feel free to add your comments to the box. Okay, well, you probably notice the space. So you can tell by looking at this that this artwork is in a room. We can see the floor, we can see the walls. Uh, based on the physical indicators, um, you probably also noticed a long black line that's extending from the ceiling. Yeah. At the end of the line, you probably noticed a um, wrapped sphere. You can see there's some texture surrounding it, sort of this webbed looking um, texture. Thank you, Tess. And it's, uh, and you can also see that that's dangling off the bottom. So what do you think, based on your observations, what do you think this is made from? Any thoughts? Tess and Philippa, feel free to chime in. Well, one of the things that I saw first was something that reminded me of a net, like the produce nets we were looking at earlier. It looks like whatever this object, the circular object is, is held in some sort of net. Okay. So this, this area, I want to point, but <laughs> this area um, around the sphere looks like it, maybe there's a net that's holding that. Okay, great. What other you materials know? do you think? Go ahead. It looks like it might not be that heavy. So playing off of what you're saying about the net is that can it really hold something that's heavy? So I'm thinking not too heavy. Interesting. So so Philippa is thinking about the structure of a net and whether it's strong enough to hold something heavy. So thinking about that that sphere or that ball there. Excellent. Okay. Great. So those are great observations. Um, this is made from rope. Uh, so there's a rope sort of uh, hanging down. And then there's a net that's holding this um, paper mache sphere. And it is actually hollow on the inside, Philippa. So that was a really astute observation. It's not very heavy at all. Even though, you know, when I first look at it, it looks to me almost like a, like a bowling ball. I kind of get that feeling. Um, it's really not that heavy. Um, and it's all covered in acrylic and um, polyurethane. So it's, um, it's all kind of stuck together. All right. Um, the title of this is Vertiginous Detour. And has anyone heard that word vertigo before? 
And what do you think about when, when you think about this idea of vertigo? I think about being afraid of heights, getting a little dizzy being far away from the ground. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So vertigo is that that feeling of just feeling like you're spinning, like you're dizzy, right? So let's try something um, so we can think a little bit more about this title. So if I was to suspend, um, here we go, I've got this, this sort of stretchy string here. I was to hold it up right now, it just kind of dangles, right? But if I add some weight to the bottom of it, what happens? Did anyone see what happened? It's spun around a little. <laughs> it's spun around it's a little bit. Yeah. yeah, it's spun, it spins around a little bit. So when you add weight to the end of something suspended, it sort of naturally will make the, the string um, spin. So that's, that's sort of what the artist is playing here uh, with this idea of vertigo. So with this sculpture, it spins a little bit um, because of the, the weight at the end. Um, so we're gonna explore a little bit um, how we can um, create our own suspended sculptures. So let's go ahead and um, think about our materials. I know we've talked a little bit about them already, but I'll give everyone a little bit um, more of a view of what I've got. And so, I'm gonna gather our materials. You're gonna want a couple um, sort of standard materials, um, scissors, tape, and then I'm also gonna show you all the materials that I've gathered here today. Everyone can see those. I've got this produce net that's a little stretchy, my nylon, some string. I've also got some things I can clip. Um, I, I've got a clothespin, some paper clips, and then I've got some some really sturdy um, chopsticks, also from my um, just from my uh, my drawers in my <laughs> in my kitchen. So all these different materials, and when we have all these different materials, um, we can really start to think about the possibilities of um, how they can be used. So explore, you know, all those different. Um, materials and, and, and think about what, what you can do with them. So as you're exploring them, um, it'd be good to kind of experiment. So why don't we do a little experimentation together? So what can your materials do? How can you alter them? So maybe I can scrunch this up, this produce net. Maybe I can give it a different shape. Can I attach things together? So if I add a rubber band here, I can make this into more of a loop. Maybe I can do something with this chopstick. I'm noticing that there's sort of these holes, right? Since this is a net, maybe I can loop this in and attach these together in some way. So think about all the different possibilities of how you can sort of alter and play with these different materials. And what one material can do maybe, um, or can't do, maybe another one can. So maybe I need something um, that's really sturdy um, that's not going to bend, that's going to kind of keep things in place, and that might be where my chopstick might come into play. Tess and Philippa, what are you, what kinds of things are you experimenting with? What have you discovered? I can go first. So I was realizing that, you know, my material, it's really flexible. And oh, so cool. I can create a lot of little knots in it. Maybe these are things I can hang something from later, but they're already kind of hanging nicely on their own. Uh, so that is what I'm experimenting with. And I just have to say, you know, participating in this as a learner, it, it, thinking about the possibilities in my material this way is making me look more closely at it and mm -hmm. think about this material in a way that I usually don't. I'm working with a material that's something um, that's used often for crafts and is a little bit different than some of the other materials that we're working with today that had other purposes. 
that I don't usually use my yarn like this. And I'm kind of wondering, all right, why don't I? It's really interesting what you've, what you've created so far. I'm wondering what you might add to it to make it, you know, to sort of maybe let gravity pull it down a little bit and how that would change what you've created so far. Yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering that too. <laughs> I would love to hear what you're playing around with. So I started having some fun just with, with paper clips and then I <laughs> put my socks, my holy socks in the holy bag. Um, <laughs> but now I'm sort of trying to figure out, um, I didn't come with scissors, but now I want to try to incorporate this plastic bucket. Mm. So I might try to poke a hole in it. I'm not really sure. That's an interesting idea. And then I, I heard there was sort of a noise when you picked up that bucket. Oh. That was uh, well. I had. I was thinking of poking holes with the, with the paper clips. Ah, I guess I'm thinking it'd be interesting if it was dangling and there was something inside. It might actually make some Ooh, noise. I like that. So there's so many different possibilities uh, to explore, uh, and uh, to think about. And this is a really, really great step to spend time with um, if you're doing this with kids. Um, a lot of times, uh, you know, we really want to kind of jump in and get to the, the final um, product. But so much of the learning uh, happens in this, um, this time where we're really observing the materials and really thinking about what they can do and what they can't do. And in that process, we, um, we ask questions, uh, we make conclusions we maybe solve problems, right? Um, which I hear Philippa is solving a problem right now of how she can attach that plastic uh, container successfully. And yeah, oh, there we go. Oh, that's a good solution. And it looks like it was inspired by the by the artwork, wrapping it inside the net. Yeah? Yeah, <laughs> that's great. That's great. Um, so I really encourage um, teachers and parents when you're working with kids on art projects, really give them time to explore the materials and take their time to kind of think about all the possibilities and talk together about it and ask each other questions um, because you'll not only you learn a lot, but um, you'll also come up with a much more interesting um, final work <laughs> in the end. Um, okay, so another thing you can do is uh, once you've explored the materials, you can sketch out a plan. So um, I have some paper here and I am going to sketch a little bit of an idea I have. Um, and I'm gonna sketch an idea for using my clay and um, my um, produce net. So let me see what I can, what I can come up with. And I'm going to invite Tess and Philippa to also do a little sketching. And I'm actually going to put my, um, my camera down so you can see what I'm drawing. Um, don't worry about this sketch being perfect. It's really just to get kind of an idea, um, not to, to be, you know, something that um, looks exactly like what you want it to in the end. So just kind of think with your pen. Let me make sure you can see my, there we go. So I'm gonna think about maybe suspending. I'm gonna use that chopstick up at the top and I'm drawing upside down. So you can be forgiving of, of my drawing as well. And here I'm gonna have my net. And I'm going to use a rubber band here to kind of bring it together, I think. And then I'm going, I'm going to put this kind of um, C-shaped clay creation that I've made another time here in the bottom. There we go. 
And this is a great step once you've experimented. This is a great step to do to really um, get your, your kids to think um, to really kind of think about their thinking, right? To really sort of illustrate their ideas um, and then to articulate, to say exactly what it is that they're thinking about and how those materials are going to work. So this gives you an opportunity to see, you know, what they're thinking and to demonstrate their learning. Um, it's also a great time for kids to share and give each other feedback and make suggestions, um, kind of like uh, Tess and Philippa and I just were doing as we were experimenting, asking questions and um, sharing some thoughts about what we could do. I know we are getting short on time, so I'm gonna, going to go ahead and um, make my final sculpture, and then we can talk a little bit about um, some other um, possibilities. That sounds great. Great. So I'm going to invite Tess and Philippa to do the same thing. I'm going to go ahead and suspend my, my net here by attaching it to this chopstick. And then I'm going to take, maybe instead of a rubber band, I'll use this purple. I'm noticing the purple and the yellow have a nice contrasting color. Maybe I can get something interesting here. And then I have this interesting sort of seashell shaped clay that I've sculpted. I am going to see if I can't attach this in some way. It's going to be a little tricky. But I see that now the string was a good idea. There we go. Now, very simply, <laughs> and it's dangling a little bit. It's kind of spinning just a little bit. Can you see that okay? Yes. There we go. So there we go. I've got my suspended sculpture. Now, if I had more time, maybe I would add some more dangly things coming off of the net. Um, but I'm quite happy with it. And I like that I can interact with it. I can kind of stretch this out more if I want to or I can scrunch it up, I can slide it from side to side, really kind of explore the different possibilities. Philippa and Tess, I'd love to see what you made. Um, so I I have a, a three, three dangles. Oh, I love here, it. <laughs> and I loved your idea of having noise. So, Very so interactive. that's my object. Um, you know what I really love about this, Tiffany, is it's very freeing to not have to name it. Hmm. You no, know, we can just create and we don't have to say actually what we're doing. It's It sort of brings you further into it that you can just like, you know, appreciate the texture and the shape and the sound and the weight and everything without having to label it something. Yeah. No, that's a that's a great um, reflection, Philippa, and I think it's it's great to see how you use the materials in very different you use different materials in um, in a different way. You combined a lot of different parts that kind of moved together and made this you know this wonderful noise. Um, so it's it's great that everyone can sort of do apply the ideas in their own way, right, mm -hmm. and not follow. Um, a, a set, a, a, a you know, set of instructions step by step. Yeah. No rights, no, well, no wrongs. Nothing can be wrong. <laughs> Everything is right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that's a good observation there. There's, there's definitely principles we're, we're exploring, right? We're exploring the materials and their possibilities, especially things that stretch and suspend. And we're thinking about what happens when we suspend materials and what happens when we add weight, right? And how um, gravity kind of impacts the, that kind of structure, right? But within those constraints, there's so many different things that we can do, so many different materials we can use, so many different ways we can put them together. Tess, what did you make? Yeah, before I show, I just want to invite folks who are watching. Um, so if any of you are following along, <laughs> also playing around with your structures, I would only not only love to hear what 
you're playing around with what your sculpture is looking like, but also any observations you have, either from a learner's perspective or an educator's perspective about what you're noticing about this process. You know, as I'm playing around with mine and I'll show you, I was thinking about, um, you know, that last piece about no, no wrong, no answer, no wrong movement. I'm enjoying this process and the experimentation that it's providing me an opportunity to play around with. And that, you know, my, my original plan it's not working how I thought because of gravity. You know, it's pulling a little bit more than I thought. But, you know, as someone experimenting with this, it's been fun to, you know, and it's been good as a learning experience to, to observe what's going on. Think about the reasons why it might be happening that way, that it might be pulling out my knots and things might be falling off and then figuring out solutions. Okay. Okay. If it's not working how I had originally intended it to work, how might I think about this differently? That's great. Thank you, Tess, for sharing. Um, I would love love to hear what others have made and, and how how this, you know, how, how many different possibilities there are. Um, I also love to think about extensions for this. So, you know, what if we considered other factors like temperature, right? Maybe one of the materials could be ice. What if, you know, it's, what if in my produce net, instead of putting this clay, I put, you know, ice cubes and put it outside on a hot day like today. <laughs> and, you know, what does that do to my artwork? And, and uh, what is that experience? How is that experience different? Right? Um, maybe, you know, it's experimenting with light, maybe at night, you know, shining a light on it and looking at the shadow on um, these nets. And I'm thinking about Philippa's uh, with all the different uh, parts that are dangling would really make an interesting moving shadow. So there's so many um, ways that we can explore and sort of extend um, these sort of art making um, activities um, that, you know, are not only uh, building our creativity and our problem solving, but also kind of building our understanding of the world and, and um, scientific principles and, and how, how things work, right? Absolutely. So I want to take us back to the collection that you were showing us earlier. Whoops, and that's, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't want to remove everybody. So again, here, Tiffany, I know that you've gathered together, you know, not only the artwork that we looked at together, but some ideas about materials that you can use, information about the artist, and then those steps that you walked us through uh, together um, yeah. as a way of thinking about how to run this activity. Yeah, so every everything um, that you would need to do this with, with kids or with a classroom is all laid out here in this Learning Lab collection. Um, and, you know, if you click on each tile, there's more information, including questions and sort of prompts to help guide the, the activity along. Um, there's more information about the artist as well. Um, which is a wonderful thing to incorporate. Um, just thinking about how, you know, these artists were real people who um, lived in a certain time and place. And, you know, this, these are theirs, their ideas that, that we're experimenting with. So it's really pretty awesome to think about that as well. I just saw a comment come through in the chat that I'd love to highlight. Um, Susanna says that they'd love to forage with national materials and do temporary sculptures with yes. That's a that idea. wonderful idea. And I mean, what a great extension opportunity to go out. And um, I'm thinking about sticks and, you know, maybe seed pods or um, I don't know, rocks would be an interesting thing to suspend that would really make uh, a nice uh, spinning <laughs> sort of mobile. Yeah, that's a great idea. And I think the kids would really love that. So Tiffany, would this be a good time to open it up for general questions if anybody yeah. in the audience has them? Absolutely. That sounds good. So for those of you watching, if you have any questions about this activity we did together, about you know transferring this to your own learning environments, about other digital resources that the Hirshhorn Museum has available, please add them in the chat. Um, like I shared at the beginning of the session, 
You can ask questions at any time using the chat box on YouTube or the comment box on Facebook. And while we wait for questions to come in, I wanted to highlight um, the Hersher and Kids at Home profile page on the Learning Lab. Um, and I, all of the great resources that exist there. You know, I've added a link to this collection in the chat, the one that we ran through together. It's also in the collection's description alongside a link to the Hersher and Kids at Home profile page. Um, Tiffany, do you want to talk a little bit about what folks will find when they visit this page? Yes, absolutely. So we, we have uh, many different projects um, available that are inspired by artists uh, in our collection. Um, and each one uh, gives you a featured artwork to look at closely as sort of a focus. And then uh, there's a hands-on project uh, that you know has step-by-step -step instructions on how, how to sort of do it. Uh, with kids. Um, you know, going back to what we just did, when I say step by step, we do, um, we try really hard to keep them as open ended um, as possible while giving uh, the teacher or the parent enough instructions um, to be able to be successful. So trying to keep that uh, creative process going, but also giving you the tools um, and support you need um, to do it. Uh, there's one new one I want to highlight that's also uh, science related. It's called Over the Moon. Uh, it's a printmaking project and it's inspired um, by the artist uh, Robert Rauschenberg uh, and the work he did on a series called Stoned Moon. Uh, and this was based on the Apollo 11 launch, which he actually um, observed uh, in Cape Canaveral and uh, made a series of, I want to say, 34 prints um, documenting that um, historic event. So this is sort of inspired by that and uh, looks at some more recent space exploration. <laughs> um, we've received a comment in the chat. The Learning Lab is such a gift. Thank you for the incredible resources. So grateful. Um, we hear that. <laughs> uh, uh, Philip and I had a question. What are there any collections, any activities that folks will find on this page that would be good to do over the summer? It kind of seems like many, if not most, if not all of these would be like this one, for example. Yeah, I think I think a lot of them would be great to do in the summer. There's there are a few that um, are a little bit messier uh, that I think might be really fun to do in the summer. Um, Let's see if you can scroll down a little bit, Tess. Uh, the one called Watercolor Worlds, that would be a wonderful one to do in the summer. Think about um, it's really meant to be sort of a, a landscape um, project, but you know, if you're taking a trip to the beach or even if you're staying at home and just enjoying, you know, the, the um, summer trees and flowers. Um, Thinking about sort of documenting that with a with a watercolor um, is a wonderful summer activity. Um, we have another one um, called Paint with No Rules, which um, I think it's down there in the bottom right, Tess. And that one is very messy, <laughs> but so much fun. And I can say my own children um, could not get enough of this project. Um, get a big piece of cardboard, put it outside, um, experiment with sort of um, thinning paint, and then also mixing it with sand or coffee grinds, um, and then really just like splattering it all over your cardboard canvas. Um, and it is really, really fun. Um, your artwork will look completely different um, from moment to moment, but uh, it's it's a great project to do. And, and my kids are also, you know, always asking to do it again. <laughs> so good for the summer when when you can hose them down afterwards. <laughs> that does look like a lot of fun. A lot of a lot of fun, messy play. Yes. <laughs> Good for all ages too. Good for uh, siblings. Yeah, I want to do it. Um, Fulpa, do you have any other questions? I, I don't think I have anything. Any other questions? I'm mostly just um, 
ready to go outside and paint cardboard <laughs> and, and do all of these great activities. Yeah, yeah, me too. Well, <laughs> thank you all of you who have joined us. Thank you so much, Tiffany, for sharing these techniques with us. This was a lot of fun and um, I'm excited to explore the new, uh, the new activities that you've made available on the lab. There are a lot of new ones that I haven't seen before um, and they all look like a lot of fun. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us too. Thank you so much for having me. It was a lot of fun to, to do this. And I, I hope that these resources can be helpful to educators and parents. I'm sure they will be. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for those of you who watched along, shared your ideas with us. Um, like we mentioned at the beginning of the session, this session will be archived once it finishes airing. So you'll be able to watch it again, share it with someone else using the link that you're watching it at now. It'll also be posted on our Learning Lab Help Center. Um, on that help center, that is where you'll also find our schedule of upcoming webinars that Philip has shared earlier today. We've got some online office hours, some sessions for getting started with digital museum resources in the learning lab. You can learn more and find links uh, to these sessions by visiting the help center. And that is something um, that we have also posted in the session description as well. If you have any questions between now and the next time we host a session, you can get in touch with us uh, via the email here on the screen, learninglab at si.edu. We'd be happy to forward any questions you have uh, to Tiffany as well. So again, thank you all. We're going to close out the session for today, uh, but we look forward to chatting with you again soon. Thank you all. Take care.